Well, hello and welcome to the first U.S. Metal TV podcast. I'm Matt McCord, your host. I was a singer of a band called Wild Dogs in the 1980s. It had drummer Dean Castronovo and Jeff Mark on guitar and Danny Hirth on bass. I also did Dr. Mastermind with Dean and a band called Mayhem with the guys from Poison Idea. But here we are, and I've got one of my good friends that I've met when we opened for Anthrax and this band, Raven, in 1984. We've been friends ever since. John Gallagher is our guest tonight. John is an amazing bass player. He's the only bass player, or I should say the first, I don't think I've ever seen another one. Uh, guy who used a whammy bar on a bass guitar. I think it was a Kaler. He builds a lot of his own guitars. He modifies a lot of his own guitars, That uh, his bass guitars, from four to eight string. And the band's been going, God, it'll be, what, 50 years this year. And, uh, you know, Metallica used to open up for them. And... John was really nice to do it. I messed up on the first Zoom call, and so he did, we said do it again. We did it over later that night. So I want to thank you, John. Raven has a really great new album called All Hell's Breaking Loose, and their last album, Metal City, is just is a great. Two, the only two metal albums I've bought in years. And their new drummer... Mike Heller, he used to play with Fear Factory. The guy's amazing. He'd never heard the band before and uh, fills in because Joe Hasselvander had a heart attack and he was a nice guy. And, uh, well, let's get into it. I just want to welcome you to the U.S. Metal Podcast. My website is usmetal.com. And you can buy all kinds of Wild Dogs, Mastermind, and Mayhem t-shirts and CDs on my website. Now tell me, <laughs> Mr. McCourt, here we are again. How are you? Oh, quite right. But uh, you know, tell me, when you wrote Wonderwall? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, I, I was just watching an interview with Noel Gallagher. It's very, <laughs> actually it was Liam. Yeah, the, he, he, the the interviewer was giving him all these insults, and he did the and asking Liam to guess who he was. He was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> They're very entertaining. You've got to give them that. They're very oh, yeah. funny. I like. I like. I actually like some of the songs. But yeah, well, I mean, it all comes from you know the Beatles, and then the, the all the the glam rock stuff like Slade and T-Rex and you hear little bits of that and Bowie and stuff like that in the, in the stuff. So uh, I guess you've got to see it comes from a uh, good soil, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of the Beatles, I bought uh, the help TV, you know, help the movie DVD oh, yeah. and hard days night um, this last month just because I haven't seen it forever. I watched, I saw the Beatles one, uh, uh, the Hard Day's Night movie when I was like four years old. Oh, jeez, yeah. That's uh, famously where Phil Collins is one of the kids running for the train. Wow. Yeah, when he was a kid, he was a child actor. So he's in that. Uh, I want to see the uh, the thing that uh, Peter Jackson did to get back. Yeah. The clips, the clips of that are unbelievable. It's It's like a fly on the wall. And it's so much fun. Because the Let It Be movie is such a downer because all, all they showed is all the stuff when they were f arguing. And obviously that was a small part. I mean, you know how it is with bands. They'll argue and, you know, fight for their territory or their part of the song or what have you. And it's all forgotten the next day. It's as if that was highlighted and that's all it was. But this uh, the stuff Peter Jackson did is phenomenal. I bought a deep out of that, we have that new uh, artificial intelligence thing where you can take a sound source and divide it into its constituent parts, which is 
kind of amazing for old archive stuff. It's uh, brilliant, you know. Uh, yeah, I, uh, that AI. I'm tired of when I call somebody. It's always a robot. <laughs> <laughs> And if it's not, it's somebody pretending to be a robot. There you go. Or I called Apple support, talked to a real person. I wanted to hook my my mixer up to my phone. Yeah. And he said, well, what's a mixer? I, I, uh, asked, yeah. I asked him, did you just fall off your tricycle? Yep. <laughs> you banged your head. Good. Get someone here that's not in diapers, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to sound like a crunchy old man, but I'm a crunchy old man. <laughs> it's things like that that make you into a curmudgeon, isn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the grumpy old man syndrome. So, before, thank you for coming back because I didn't know what I was doing. It's recording now. So that's good. Yeah, you've got a got a tour coming up. You got a new album. Well, it's been out for a while. I waited on iTunes to buy it, you know, before it was available, and then I bought it. it seemed like it took forever, but um, you're going to do the United States starting in March. Yeah, all great things. They, yeah, all hell's breaking loose came out to the end of June, and we're. Obviously very happy with it, but it's great to see, you know, the fans and the critics seem to love it too. Uh, and you know how it is. People people get it when it's the real thing. And we just wanted an album that was like 40 minutes long, 10 songs that just smashed your face in. And that's pretty much what this one does. Yeah, it kicks ass. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, unrelenting, you know. Is that my color? I got told off by our friend Metal Mike who runs Odd Shock uh, magazine in Holland. He's like, uh, so uh, way too many ballads on this album, huh? <laughs> <laughs> was it, does Mike have a studio? Yes, that was what was interesting on this album where before we had, you know, we'd written the songs and then Mike came into the mix and you know, he had suggestions and obviously his drum parts with their arrangements and stuff. And there was some recording here and some recording there. And then we ended up doing it at Michael Wagner's. And then the mix was three different guys till we got what we wanted. With this, it was all the three of us, you know, kicked the songs around between each other and had ideas. Everyone chipped in ideas. And then we did the arrangements uh, Mike did his drums we went backwards and forwards with that and then me and Mark went out to Los Angeles and we were in there for like three weeks doing everything else, doing the guitars, the bass, the vocals and any other funny stuff we wanted to add in there and you know we we had a large cache of songs maybe 30 wow and we were able to pretty much go, well, this one or this one would be a great opener and this one and this one would follow and this would be a great one to finish with. And, you know, we were kind of able to pre-sequence before we really got into it, which was great. And, you know, because we're old school that way. It's not just front load your album with uh, yeah, three or four great songs and, who cares what's on afterwards? We want them all to be great and we want it to, you know, kind of tell a story. You know, you, you want it to have some ups and downs and to, to go through it, you know? And like I said, the drums are just amazing on that. It, it yeah, really he did it. That, and that was, you know, part and parcel of it. I mean, back in the day, we would just all go in and play and you get a drum track and then if you need to fix guitars and basses and stuff, you do that. Um, the way Mike's doing it, we do a, a rough guitar or guitar and bass thing, usually to a click, and give it to him. And then he disassembles it and goes, well, you know, if these guys were playing this in real time, they would start at this speed here and they would slow up a bit for the verse 
and then get a little faster on the B part and then get real fast on the chorus or back off. So there's all these little incremental time changes, which makes it feel real, which is what you do when you play real, you know? Yeah. It's not just bump, 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 bump. It's this year's push and pull that makes it uh, makes it human. Uh, so he'll do that and try it, and we see how it feels. And if not, then try this. You know, just keep going over it, and then, okay, what are you doing here? I love that drum fill, but nobody else is following it. Let's change what we're doing on guitar and bass to go with what you're doing. Or it doesn't fit, try something else. So he's having the latitude and the, the ability to improvise and change stuff like guitarists and bass players and vocalists have had forever. And But back in the day, it was like you, you only get the chance to go through one time for the drums and that's it. So it was uh, more of getting a take rather than getting, a, you know, a great performance where all the parts are exactly what you want. The way he's got it, he can play it a thousand times if he wants and go, well, I like this, I like this. And write, basically, write a drum part in that manner. Wow. And then, you know... If he feels he wants to play it for real right after that, rather than just glue it together, go for it. That's great. So we've, you know, basically doing it in this jigsaw fashion, but managing to keep that live feel and the aggression and everything that's part and parcel of that. Because like I said, our, our only experience working with a click track, we really hated it because it took the life out of what we were doing, because, again, it was just boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And that doesn't doesn't work, because the dynamic of the band is the push and pull, really, between the guitar and the drums. That makes it alive, like it's yeah. a living yeah. entity. Because it's just like one guy's pushing and the other guy's pulling back, or vice versa. And... It would be in the past quite often Mark would be pushing and either Rob or Joe would be pulling back. But when Mike playing, there's a little bit of both and it really adds to the excitement. I mean, and these are incremental little factors, but it makes a huge difference to the feel. It sounds like you're playing live in the studio. Just oh, live. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. And it, if it didn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing it this way. But it's... Uh, it works on a number of levels. Obviously, I mean, Mike's out in California and me and Mark are out here in Florida. At least I'm in Florida half the time. Uh, so, you know, what with technology, you can bounce ideas instantly backwards and forwards. You don't have to be in the same room. Uh, although we did do some writing. Uh, in 2019, we played... Japan and China and we flew back via LA and stayed there for like a week and a half two weeks and did some writing together and that's that's the optimum way to write where it's instant and everyone's in each other's face and you can say what about oh I like that I like that because it, it just morphs into more than its parts you know but I mean that's in a sense what happens it just stretched out a little longer. Like maybe I'll come up with a verse chorus idea and they'll go, that's great, but I don't like what you did for the solo, but I've got an idea. How about we do this? Or how about you change them around? I don't hear that as being the chorus. What if this was? And if we put this kind of melody, I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So it's all about bouncing it off each other to make it more than what it started with, you know? Speaking of drummers, uh, what what happened to Joe Hasselbander? Well, he uh, he basically had a really bad heart attack. Oh. Uh, and it was two days before we were doing a string of dates. We were got, had four dates in the States and then an 11 or 12 date tour in Europe along with a festival. And... Basically, for health reasons, he just can't play drums like that anymore. You know, and I, I don't think he was that unhappy. He was, uh, you know, I think he was happy to get off the road. 
to get off, you know, go back home from the circus for a bit, definitely. Uh, but, you know, it, it worked out for us in that we had to scrabble and get a couple of guys to fill in. And the, the second guy that filled in on three of the American shows was Mike. And we didn't know Mike. Turned out we'd actually seen him play with Fear Factory on one of the cruises we did. And funnily enough, that was the first time he'd saw or heard anything of us. He was there and he just said, oh, let's go see this band. This is the band that apparently Metallica opened up for. Ha, ha, ha. Let's check this out. And he said he was blown away. He loved it. He says, how come I've never heard this band before? You know? So whether... Didn't we, make it to the we still, we still have that going on, you know. There's still uh, a lot of people don't know what the deal is. But he found out and he loved it. And so when he got the offer, do you want to come and fill in for these few shows? You said, yeah. So we went to Jersey. We played Jersey. We played Baltimore. And we played uh, somewhere in Delaware. And the first gig, we just talked for half an hour and then went on and played for an hour and a half. And wow. he was no, he was not perfect. <laughs> That's great. He, he charted it out and was just playing along. Um, Mark said, why did you play that there? And he goes, because that's what's on the record. I said, oh, you know, <laughs> you, can go, you can go crazier than that, you know. I can, yeah. Speed things up a bit too. I can, yeah. Improvise, really? So the next show was a thousand percent better than the first one. And the third one was a thousand percent better again, where we're just throwing, you know, hardballs at each other and bouncing them back. And we had that thing with the bass and drums instantly, the ESP thing. It was like, oh, this is great. Because uh, that's not that common, you know. When drummers um, just go wild and are unrestrained, that's the, the best performances you get. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to have that, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of drummers, even even Mike, because he's so technically minded. You, you talk about Keith Moon, but the 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 aggression and the energy part of it, you know, factor that into your technique as well, and boom, you've got something, you know. And there's drummers like that, obviously, even back to Buddy Rich and uh, Tony Williams, they were nutcases, you know, they were crazy guys. The drummer is always a crazy guy. Yeah, Dean. Our Dean, Dean Casanova. Dean's a phenomenal drummer, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that that's what you need. And it, it's funny how people who, you know, when you're a young fan, let's say, oh, you know, the singer, the guitar player. And as you get older, you realize it's that's all great. But if you've got a crap drummer and a crap bass player, it doesn't work. It's not good to the point where you can have a great drummer and a great bass player. And if the other guys are not so hot or having a bad night, it doesn't hurt it as much. You know? I've been playing so drums. That engine room going on. I mean, geez, look at Nirvana. Uh, yeah, Dave Grohl. Dave great. Grohl, man. You've got a powerhouse like that. Yeah, I mean, it almost doesn't matter what you put on top of it, you know? That's just uh, gravy at that point, you know? So that, you know... You can say that about you know, Neil Peer, John Bonham, whoever, you know, but that's what it's all about. So, I love drums. I've been playing since yeah, I was five. Uh, you know, drums can be incredibly musical and and can make a huge difference to what's going on. If you've just got a pedestrian part going on, uh, you know, I mean, Look at Rush. A lot of people like that first Rush album, but it's almost unlistenable if you'd heard the first Rush live album. Because yeah. when Neil Peart got his hands on those songs and, you know, injected some craziness into them, that's what it's, you know, that, that makes just all the difference in the world. So, you know, everyone has to be... You know, especially in a three-piece band, you've got to be inventive. You've got to be, you've got to be doing stuff, you know? Everyone's got to play off each other. And you, you orchestrate so that it sounds like there's more than just three guys, you know? And that's something that 
we started work on very early on when we first went to be a free piece. It was like, oh, wow, this is, this is different. It's kind of naked, but you've got all this room. Yeah. There's- you've got the ability to go, oh, call out and play some fills and say, oh, me and the drummer and really lock in and do some crazy stuff here while he's doing solos and, oh, well, i got to stop playing some octaves and play with a dirtier sound or maybe use some effects or, you know, you, you use techniques and tricks to, to fill holes. And, you, I, you know, I'd, I'd heard and saw three-piece bands and some of them, you know, Cream and Rush and Jimmy Grand Hendrix and ELP. Grand Funk Railroad. They, they had ways and means to do this. And there was other ones where maybe the bass player was just going plod, plod, plod when it was a solo. And I was just like, ah, we need a bit more. We need something to, you know, not just uh, making a, a low fart. We need, a, we need a little bit of music going on here to, to carry the day. So that's a, you know, it's a challenge and uh, it's very rewarding to make that work and to pull it off, you know. My Grand Funk Railroad's bass player. Did you ever oh, like hell yeah. Mel. Mel. Mel was a monster and what, yeah. a, what a great. And that was one of those bands like, uh, who else? Mountain, Felix Pabellotti. Oh, I love that. Like huge, dirty sound and very melodic bass lines. And it, it's it's just beautiful, you know. One, well, two of my favorite bands, right there. Yeah. So, I think we're running out of time again. Wow, you're going out on tour with Vicious Rumors. Yeah, we got got a great tour, got a great package. Uh, we've got Vicious Rumors going out with us, uh, Lotharo from Canada, and Wicked. Uh, it's a friend of mine's son's band, great young band, kind of like on the glam side of things, you know. Uh, they're from like upstate New York. So it's a great four band bill. And we start March 22nd in Florida, work our way around up to California, up the West Coast, back down through the Midwest, over to the East Coast in Canada and back down. So that'll go right through to the first end of the first week of May. Wow. And then we have a couple of weeks off and then we go to Japan. We've got a tour in Japan and then we come back and there's a possibility of some South American stuff there in June. We've got festivals in Europe in July, festivals and dates. We're looking at uh, Mexico. We've got a festival in Mexico. We are looking at Australia, uh, Singapore, Thailand for the back end of next year. So, and in in between all that, uh, I'm already writing. Got a lot of great ideas and uh, I'm going to start bouncing them off the guys soon. And it's uh, going to be busy, <laughs> which is good. Well, you've had two really great albums with Metal City and All Hell's Breaking Loose. And I played that on my cable access show a lot. Cool, man. Thank you. Great video. And I, I almost forgot we're going to the, uh, the UK in February with uh, Girl School and Alcatraz. So that'll be a great bill as well. And they're all friends of us, so it'll be awesome. We've got like, uh, I don't know, seven or eight dates there. We played with girl school like in '82. Uh, oh, geez, yeah, we we in San Francisco. Twenty-seven dates with them in England in '82, and then we had them out with us in 2013 in Europe. We did about I don't know, fifteen, twenty dates then, and then we did some dates with them back in 2019 in Australia. It was us, girl school, and tank, which was great. Wow, that would be good everyone. Deal. We all knew each other, so it was just like one big, uh, one big war story party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tanks fun too. <laughs> yeah, great guy. Had, had three days of really good laughter with them. Oh yeah, <laughs> just don't let them steal your beer. You won't have any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they already they did that. They did that really good. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They're they're professional drinkers, <laughs> especially the drummer. He's uh, this guy was from the Isle of Man. He said, 
Oh, yeah. I don't know. Well, gee, you, have, you probably had three hollow legs. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, nope, I think I think we might have covered it all. But, all uh, right. Um, thank you for letting me do it again. And uh, have a good Christmas and Happy New Year. All the best to you for Christmas and New Year and for everyone out there. Thanks for your support. And we will see you on the road in 2024, which is going to be our 50th anniversary as a band. Congratulations. The big five or that there's only a couple of bands who've been staying together with the same basic core people forever. Yes. I mean, just. Somebody sent me a list of that, and we were up in the top ten, which was scary. I mean, like with with people like the Stones and Aerosmith and things like that. I said, really? So I was uh, kind of humbling, you know. It's it's like uh, there's a an obvious legacy there, which we're, we're always aware of, but we don't just sit and play the oldies. We you know, we're a vibrant band and we create new music and we will continue to do so. At the same time, have fun playing the stuff we've done over this long, strange trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a long, strange trip on your tour. And hey, the third album will probably be your best one with Mike. Well, we got, uh, like I say, we got some really cool ideas and we've set the bar. We have to raise it once again. That's what it's all about. Go in there and create some mayhem. I'm looking forward to it. Good. It's been a long time since we were on the same bill opening for you and Anthrax in 1984. Jeez, it's true. Starry nights. I remember it well. Or at least I remember it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember much better now. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, thank you again. And uh, I'll talk to you later. If, you, if your daughter needs help in Portland, I've been here my whole life. I can give her some tips. Is she working here? Yeah. Yeah, she's doing great. Good. Well, uh, I will talk to you later. Thank you very much. And thanks for being on the U.S. Metal TV podcast. You got it, man. I got the recording. Hope, Hope to see you in April. I will be there. You're good, man. Thank you. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for checking into the U.S. Metal TV podcast with Matt McCord here. That was John Gallagher from the band Raven. And... We wish them luck on their new tour, and I've got a lineup of guests coming on the show. Dean Castronovo, my old friend, we found uh, we found me and Jay Malice found him one night, and the next week we were doing the Malice demos, and he's supposed to be on next. And I've got Alejandro Mercado, John Five's drummer, and. Uh, he's a great guy, and I've got a bunch of people lined up. Heavy metal right here on the podcast. USmetal.com is a place to go. That's my website, US Metal Records, is who brings us here. So I will leave you with that. Thank you for listening. See you next time.